American Graffiti is a wistful, nostalgic look back at a more innocent time in American history, right after World War II, when the American middle class was strong, powerful, self-confident, and exuberant, and had a belief that they could accomplish anything. First, I want to look at the film in the context of art that explores the human condition. Fancy way of saying the film's authenticity. Second, what the film says about the loss of innocence. And third, how ultimately the film has a message of hope. I can attack so I can't. One of the main characters of American Graffiti takes center stage is the teen cruising car culture of Southern California in the 1950s. That culture may have died out in Southern California and other major metropolitan areas in the early 60s, but I grew up in that culture because in the 1980s, it was alive and well in Southern Missouri. We didn't have a drive-in, but we had the Dairy Mart and an Uncle Donnie's pool hall. Every Friday and Saturday night, particularly in the summertime, teens would gather in the IGA parking lot and then cruise Main Street all the way up to the high school and then back again, rinse and repeat all evening. Half the guys I went to school with had some sort of hot rod. On any given day in our school's parking lot, you could find old Mustangs, GTOs, 55, 56, 57 Chevys. One of my buddies had a 66 Chevy pickup. Another one had a 59 Ford pickup. We had all the hijink shenanigans and pranks, messing with the cops. We had teen romance with all its associated drama. We had the school dances, again, with all its drama. We had a lot of drag races. And we had fighting and drinking. I know somebody who I grew up with who's the equivalent of every single character in American Graffiti. <laughs> My friends will tell you, I'm in the movie. I'll let y'all figure out who that might be on your own. Couple quick stories. The movie's about nostalgia, so let's get nostalgic. One Friday or Saturday night, Moose and I were hanging out in IGA parking lot. We were off to one side leaning against Moose's car, watching a bunch of girls having a big argument about something. My brother showed up. He nosed his truck in at an angle so there was a triangle space between Moose's car and my brother's truck. We're standing there watching as more and more people are gathering to watch this big argument between all these girls. At some point, I don't remember who instigated it, somebody came up with the idea, hey, people like drama? Let's give them some drama. Let's start a rumor. And then we decided the only way we could start a rumor like this short notice, pretend like we're getting in a fight. But who was going to fight? Before my brother got into drugs, he and I were very close. It was known, you messed with one, you messed with both. So no one would believe we would publicly fight. And Moose and I were best friends. Again, you messed with one of us, you messed with both of us. So no one would believe we would have a fight. Eric, my brother, and Moose, they were friends. But Moose and I ran in different circles than Eric and his friends. So Eric and Moose, it is. So the plan was... Eric and Moose got into a fight, and I'd try to break it up, and things would get way out of hand. We wanted this to look good, believable, so we all shook hands and swore we wouldn't get angry because we were going to say some nasty stuff, and Eric and Moose at first, and then me later, were going to have to throw real punches. This was going to be a real knockdown Donnybrook. At the word go, Eric and Moose start screaming at each other. Their faces are turning red. They're dropping F-bombs, calling each other's moms, my mom, every name in the book you can imagine. At one point, Eric does a double-handed shove of Moose. Moose body blocked Eric into the side of his truck with a big bang, put a big dent in the fender. And then they just stood back and started trading haymakers, swinging for the fences. It's at this point I start yelling, guys, guys, stop fighting. Start trying to break it up. But of course, they ain't listening. So I start to get more and more aggressive. I'm pushing and shoving. I'm throwing elbows, trying to do whatever I can to break up this fight. I get in the middle of them, and I'm catching live rounds, front, sideways, and back. And at some point, we all three fall to the ground and are rolling around on the concrete, end up half under my brother's truck. I whisper, I think we're good, guys. You think so? Yeah, yeah. Time to wrap this up. 
So when we come out from under the truck, I grab my brother by the collar, open the door of his truck, shove him in and yell, you get out of here. He takes off doing a burnout, screaming, I'm going to get you, Moose. Moose is yelling, come on back anytime. I'm shoving Moose and yelling at him, let's get out of here. Moose does a burnout as we take off. We'd agreed to meet at Moose's house when it was all said and done. We come in the front door, high-fiving, horse playing, all proud of ourselves. Moose's mom and her church friends are playing bridge in the living room. <laughs> we were dripping blood all over the freshly scrubbed floors. We had a hard time convincing her not to call the cops. Mind you, we'd been in a real fight. Black eyes, bloody noses, busted lips, busted knuckles, our shirts were torn up. I had road rash on the back of my shoulder. We were so messed up, she thought we'd been assaulted. She wasn't amused when she realized we'd done it to ourselves. I'll tell you all exactly how amused she was. She called our mother. Mom wasn't amused either. And the payoff for all of this? For weeks, I had people coming up to me. Hey, Randy, what was with you and Moose and Eric in the parking lot the other night? I'd always say, ah, we were just messing with everybody, trying to start a rumor. They'd always say, oh, that makes sense. Because I'd heard, whew, I'm here to tell you, rumors, once they get circulating, you know how I said no one would believe that Moose and I would get into a fight? Well, I was wrong. Because the wildest rumor I heard, I'd pulled a knife, shanked Moose. Now, never mind, he didn't go to the hospital. And come Monday morning, we were at school hanging out as usual. But rumors. Most guys can relate to Toad. We somehow convince a girl that's way out of our league to hang out with us. And then everything we do to try to impress her backfires. Toad gets involved in an armed robbery trying to get some booze. Gets drunk off that booze. Pukes all over the girl's shoes because of that booze. When it comes to making out, Toad doesn't have a clue. He gets his car stolen. Gets into a fight. Gets beat up. He loses his car again. The girl has to find her own way home. Poor Toad is sitting on the curb thinking all is lost when the girl comes back over, sits down beside him, and says, Hey, I like you. Call me tomorrow. How did that happen? One more story. I was 15. My class was having a skate party. All our families are there. It was getting towards the end of the evening. I'm hanging out with my friends when one of the girls from the class comes skating over, pulls me aside and says, if you don't ask Sherry to go out and skate with you on the next couple skate, you're going to catch hell on Monday. Well, why would I want to ask Sherry? Oh, oh, I'm not going to say Sherry was the prettiest girl in our class, but for the purposes of this story, close enough. Let me put it this way. If that girl hadn't come over and told me it was in my best interest to go talk to Sherry, I would have never approached her. I thought she was way out of my league. Didn't stand the chance. When the DJ announces, next song is couple skate, get your partners now, I go wheeling over to the girls and say, hey, Sh <clears throat> hey Sherry, would you like to skate with me? She gives me the prettiest smile, says, why, yes, I would. I am mortified. It's just starting to dawn on me that there's a girl that I thought was out of my league who's interested in me to the point that she's willing to have one of her friends come prod me to get me to come ask her to skate. I do not want to screw this up. We're both very awkward trying to find something to talk about when the couple skate officially begins. Now, what they would do is at the far turn, they would turn off the lights. Idea, as the couple skated through, they could steal a kiss. I'm not even thinking about trying that one. We went through the dark a couple of times, no problem. But what happened is when we were coming back around again, somebody had dropped their drink. Ice was scattered all over the floor. I missed the ice. Sherry didn't. She fell. But in the process, she grabbed onto my hand tight, slung shot me around, and as I came around, my skates hit the ice and stopped. And I went face first, right between her legs. We had reenacted the famous scene from Romancing the Stone. At that moment, the song ended and the lights came up and there's this huge roar in the building. I look up 
and she has this surprise, shocked look on her face. Immediately scramble to my feet, help her up. Now we have the problem, though. We got to skate the whole length of the rink to get back to where we're supposed to be. We had to skate a gauntlet. Everybody was hooting and hollering. Guys yelling at me, way to go, Randy. Girls cheering on Sherry, Sherry, Sherry. I am mortified, trying to find the nearest hole I can crawl into. Sherry's hands start shaking. Well, was she so angry? I look over. She's giggling. This is the funniest thing she's ever seen. My problems aren't over yet, though. Her daddy, he's a minister, one of the bigger churches in town. We come wheeling up to them. Her mama is looking anywhere but me, because it's pretty clear she's trying to be the stern mother, but she can't keep a straight face either. This is the funniest thing she's ever seen. Her daddy, he ain't amused. He's staring daggers at me. I'm smart enough to know anything I say at this point is just going to make things worse. So I let go of Sherry's hand, going to skate off, run. Sherry says, see you Monday. Her daddy says, no, you won't. I look back and behind her dad's back, Sherry goes, okay, Toad, I feel you, brother. To this day, I still don't know how I got the girl. My point in telling all these stories is me taking the long way around to explain American Graffiti's story is authentic to many Americans, myself included, lived experience. We believe the story because we've lived that story. Because the story rings true, the symbolism and messaging of the story ring true. This is a very powerful form of persuasion. 1962, the setting of the movie, is a transitional period from the idealism, optimism, innocence of the 50s into the social unrest and chaos and jadedness of the 60s. Each of the main characters represents a different element of the American middle class. Steve and Lori are the all-American girl and boy, but they also represent America's attitudes towards love and romance. In the 1950s, the American middle class had very traditional attitudes towards love, romance, sex, and marriage. Simple explanation, serial monogamy. When you're committed to one person, you don't do anything with anybody else. In the late 60s through the early 70s, the American middle class re-examined their attitudes towards sex, love, and romance. They tried on for size all sorts of ideas, free love, polyamory, swinging, threesomes, orgies, all sorts of stuff. By the 80s, the American middle class had rejected all of it and returned back to more traditional serial monogamy. That transition is represented in Steve and Lori's relationship. Beginning of the evening, they're a committed couple. Then they start talking about having an open relationship, seeing other people. Steve's going to leave, mess around while he's off to college, but then come back and maybe things will work out. But at the end, they reject all that, become a committed couple again. Carl, on the other hand, represents the part of the American middle class that's become disillusioned with the American dream. He doesn't want the house with the picket fence, the pretty wife, the two kids, 1.5 dogs. But on the other hand, he has no clue what he wants. He's aimless and lost. Carl's ex-girlfriend is still madly in love with him. He's happy to play around with her, but he won't commit. Instead, he chooses to chase after something he can never have the woman and the T-bird. Carl's a coward. He doesn't stand up to his friends. He doesn't stand up to his ex-girlfriend and her friend. He doesn't report wrongdoing when he sees it. He doesn't stand up to the pharaohs. And then at the end, we learn he lives in Canada as a writer. He dodged the draft. I would argue that Carl represents academia, college kids, faculty, professors. They turned a blind eye and allowed the circumstances to arise that led to the social unrest and chaos of the 60s. Once that unrest and chaos started to happen, they whipped it up, fanned the flames. But when they faced a backlash, they ran away, refusing to accept any responsibility for their actions. John Milner represents the traditional American middle class. He is the 1950s, 
rock and roll, cruising, chasing girls, fast cars, racing. But he has morals and ethics. John pulls down Toad's pants while Toad's trying to flirt with a couple of women at the beginning of the movie. John's rough and rowdy. Everybody's fair game for his humor, but he's extremely loyal. When he sees Toad in trouble later at night, he immediately stops, jumps out, runs to his rescue. He's willing to fight off two guys to protect his friend. When John realizes that the girl that just got into his car is underage, he immediately switched to Big Brother mode. When the other car full of teens throws the water balloon, hits the girl, he immediately helps her teepee that car. When Falfa wrecks his car, John is one of the first ones there to make sure everybody's okay. At the end of the race, after everybody's safe, Toad celebrates, John, you won. And John says, no, he had me. John is saying, no, time moves on. Me and my way of life, the way of life of the American middle class in the 1950s is gone. In John's case, literally, he dies in 1964 by no cause of his own. But like John, the American middle class of the 1950s did not survive the 1960s. Toad wants to be Steve. He wants to be the all-American boy, but he can't. So he's happy to follow Steve's lead, be a copy of the all-American boy. Toad represents the part of the middle class that follow the rules, do what they're told, stay between the lines. Sadly, more often than not, this is the group that gets screwed. He doesn't dodge the draft. He goes off to war. He dies. Falfa is the anti-Milner. On the surface, they're the same. Cruising, fast cars, racing, women... But Falfa has no morals. He's completely selfish and self-centered, narcissistic. He's the reason the innocence idealism of the 50s collapsed. The movie shows that by 1962, there were cracks in the system. People in positions of power, like the police, the principal, are acting in a capricious, arbitrary manner. And other people in positions of power, like the teacher, are evil, taking advantage of young girls. Crime is on the rise, armed robbery, stolen car. There's addiction, the wino at the liquor store. Times, they are a change Ultimately, the movie is about hope, the mysterious woman and the T-bird, the American dream. Carl can never have the American dream. He's too jaded, cynical, cowardly. Unfortunately for Toad, he got chewed up by the American dream, lost his life chasing the American dream. Milner had the American dream, but his time came and went. I need to clarify something. The American dream is not house, car, wife, kids, whatever. The American dream is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The ability to live your life as you see fit without the need for anybody else's permission. Steve and Lori, they achieved the American dream. American Graffiti says there is hope. You can have the American dream. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you're all still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And while you're at it, feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.